Under the auspices of an American religious foundation in October 2008, I had a public debate in Oxford with a Christian apologist, an Irish mathematician called John Lennox. A couple of days later, the same John Lennox went up to Scotland, to Inverness, where he spoke to a large audience, and he quoted the recent Oxford debate with me. But finally, and this is the grand irony, I was stunned last Tuesday night, completely stunned, by this. Richard Dawkins started off by saying that he'd no difficulty with the concept of Einstein's God. Now, he says this in his book. Einstein's God, that is, in some sense, the laws of nature or something like this, which is interesting because it shows that he senses there's a need for an explanation of the beginnings of things. We asked him directly, how did it all begin? He doesn't know. So it's a matter of faith, whether it's blind or not, you must judge, for him, that there's a purely naturalistic explanation of it. But the very fact that he would talk about Einstein's God, even in his book, fascinated me. But now came the stunning revelation. And I, I missed it in one sense, and when the lecture was over, I realized what he'd said. He said, a good case could be made for the deistic God. Well, that's staggering. Because that's exactly what happened to Anthony Flew not long ago. Anthony Flew is a philosopher who used to have Dawkins' place in the world as the world's most famous atheist, a world expert on the philosophy of David Hume, who comes from Scotland, as all of you know. And Anthony Flew, at a high age, has become convinced of deism. That is, there is a God who started it all off. And what convinced him? DNA. And its complexity. The nature of its complexity. Not just that it's complex. This glass of water is complex, ladies and gentlemen. It's the semiotic nature of the complexity. And yet here is Richard Dawkins last Tuesday saying, a good case can be made for a deistic God. But look what that does with his argument from simple to complex. Deism says there must have been a God in the beginning to start it off because it's too complex. I don't know where the argument is going to go next, but I was utterly fascinated at this apparently new concession. Anthony Flew has moved a very long way. If Dawkins now believes that a good case can be made for deism, then it seems to me that knocks the heart out of his argument about complexity here. But we're not finished yet. Now, let's go back to the Oxford debate of a few days earlier, and I hope once again you'll forgive me for playing an actual recording of a minute or so of what I said there, so that you can see what John Lennox was doing mining the Eddington concession. The question for debate in Oxford was, has science buried God? And the chairman began by putting it to me point blank. As we begin, is has science buried God? Well, which God? I mean, we could take Einstein's God, which is not really a personal God at all, but which is a sort of uh, poetic metaphor for the mystery, that which we don't understand about the universe. We could take a deist God, a sort of God of the physicists, a God of somebody like Paul Davies, who devised the laws of physics, God the mathematician, uh, God who put together the cosmos in the first place and then sat back and watched everything happen. Uh, and that would be, a, the deist God would be one that I think it would be, one could make a reasonably respectable case for that, not a case that I would um, accept, but I think it is a serious discussion that we could have. The third kind of God is one of which there are thousands and thousands of varieties, Zeus and Thor and Apollo and Amun-Ra and Yahweh. And uh, we don't actually need to go through all those because I've, um, as Larry has said, I've encountered John Lennox before and I know what he, the, the God he believes in, which is the Christian God. So we only have to talk about the Christian God. John Lennox is a scientist who believes that Jesus turned water into wine. A scientist who believes that Jesus somehow influenced all those molecules of H2O and introduced proteins and carbohydrates and tannins and, and alcohol and turned it into wine. 
he believes that Jesus walked on water. I had been accustomed to debating with sophisticated theologians and I come across John Lennox who is a scientist who believes in all those things. In particular, he believes that the creator of the universe, the God who devised the laws of physics, the laws of mathematics, the physical constants, who devised the parsecs of space, billions of light years of space, billions of years of time, that this paragon of physical science, this genius of mathematics, couldn't think of a better way to rid the world of sin than to come to this little speck of cosmic dust and have himself tortured and executed so that he could forgive himself. That is profoundly unscientific. Not only is it unscientific, it doesn't do justice to the grandeur of the universe. It's petty and small-minded. And that's the God that John Lennox believes in. Now, I, I, I think you get the point. I was precisely doing an Eddington concession. I was saying you could perhaps make a case for a deistic God, one that I wouldn't accept, but that at least is an argument that we could have a, a, a serious argument about. We could actually talk about that. That would be something that we, we, would, we, could, we could have a scientific disagreement about, perhaps. But I didn't need to do that because I already knew that John Lennox believed that Jesus turned water into wine, walked on water, etc. I was deliberately making the Eddington concession about deism in order to show up, by contrast, the fatuousness of this man's beliefs. And yet see what he did. He took the Eddington concession, went up to Scotland two days later, and said that I was being converted to deism like <laughs> Anthony Flew. Uh, he, he also said that uh, he, he didn't think of it at the time. That's perfectly true. He never mentioned it during the actual Oxford debate. Um, he got it from a, a journalist called Melanie Phillips, who was also at the Oxford debate and who wrote it up in The Spectator. And she also uh, mined the Eddington concession. She said, arch-atheist Richard Dawkins is an evolutionist, but many are now asking whether the dyed-in-the-wool critic of religion may be well evolving in his views about God. You see, in a recent debate with theist and Christian John Lennox, he let slip what many would regard as a major blooper. He actually admitted that there might be a case for theism of sorts. This was a worldwide view of change of seismic proportions. It was a most remarkable turnaround for someone who had spent over five decades championing the atheist cause to all, doesn't quite make sense, does it? To, to all of a sudden renounce it was an incredible achievement. <laughs> Even more jaw-droppingly, Dawkins told me that, I had to talk with this dreadful woman afterwards, Rather than believing in God, he was more receptive to the theory that life on Earth had indeed been created by a governing intelligence, but one which had resided on another planet. <laughs> Leave aside the question of where that extraterrestrial intelligence had come from, is it not remarkable <laughs> that the arch-apostle of reason finds the concept of God more unlikely as an explanation of the universe than the existence and plenipotentiary power of extraterrestrial little green men. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie Phillips is sufficiently infamous throughout Britain, you won't have heard of her, but she is infamous as one of the most bigoted uh, and unpleasant journalists in the whole of British journalism. Um, it's easy to see why John Lennox, in his Scottish speech, preferred not to acknowledge her as the source of his stunning and staggering revelation.